to a brand new episode. Yes, if you see the smoke, I got my protections burning. I have kind of been putting this one off for a bit. Most of my reviews I film at night. This one, we're filming during the day because this whole thing just creeps me out. <laughs> So, for today's video, we are talking about The Deliverance. Now, this is directed by Lee Daniels, who also did Precious and The Butler. And it was written by David Kogeshal. He also did The Orphan, First Kill, and Elijah Bynum, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, and it's streaming on Netflix. Now, it is based on a true story. We are not going to get into all of that, really, because we're going to start a new series called Hollywood versus Reality or Hollywood versus Truth. I'm not sure yet. I'm not quite sure what to call it. We will talk about the similarities and differences within the story. And I know, who knows, maybe one's scarier than the other. I think the real story is scarier than the one that we got in this movie. I'm gonna be for real. We're not gonna really talk about that all that much. It is inspired by the Ammons Haunting Tick case. So you can look it up if you want to before the video comes out. And it's also known as the 200 Demons House. That number is, you know, debated upon. It goes anywhere from 200 to 400. And it was in 2011, so very recent. Uh, Latoya Ammons and her mother, Rosa Campbell, and three children reported paranormal activity. And there is a documentary called Demon House on Tubi. That's what we're gonna be using to cross-reference some things because that documentary scared the shit out of me. <laughs> so the basic premise for the film is an Indiana family discovered strange demonic occurrences that convinces them and their community that the house is haunted. Andre Day plays Ebony. If there's one thing, cause there's, this movie is getting a lot of slack online. If there's one thing about this film that I really enjoyed, it was the acting. It's good acting, at least. Glenn Close as Alberta. Caleb McLaughlin plays Nate. He's like the oldest child. And yeah, he's from Stranger Things. Don't get to see the Stranger Things kids outside of Stranger Things all that much. He did a really good job though. Miss Lawrence is Aisha. That's a very small role but a good one. I'm gonna be for real. I think a lot of people are looking at Glenn Close as the comedic value of this movie, but I don't think she's supposed to be taken like too comedically. Whereas Miss Lauren's character, uh, yeah. <laughs> Monique plays Cynthia Henry, the, the CPS worker. Now, if you look at the real photos, I would say casting should have been swapped. Andra Day should have been Cynthia and Monique should have been Ebony. If we're going off of how the real people look, I think that would have been better casting. But if y'all know kind of like the T though, Monique and Lee Daniels, oh, their beef goes deep and it goes back to Precious. It has to do with Oprah and it's basically why Monique got blackballed through most of Hollywood. So it's nice to see them like working together again. I also like how going from Precious, Monique's character in that, to this, like the versatility, it's incredible. <laughs> Demi Singleton plays Shantae, the daughter, and Anthony B. Jenkins plays Andre, the youngest son. He did such a damn good job. Say what you want, for a little child having to act out some of the things that he did, he did a really freaking good job. Now, a few disclaimers. Like I said before, we're not going to talk too much about the real thing, saving that for another video. But it is a Lee Daniels film, so it's to be expected that there will be a kind of narrative regarding race or I guess more so in this one, it feels more like a perception that people have because it doesn't really dive into racism that much. But when it does, it's always in relation to Glenn Close's character, which I think is interesting. That was weird. That light, I've never had any issues with it. I just had to stop, walk away for a bit. We've come back. <laughs> Bruh, I was already on the fence of if I even really wanted to talk about this movie anymore because the energy around it is so foul. So with that, let's just dive into this. Now I want to address this 
movie and the topics in it with some ease because I'm sure there's a lot to it that I can't really pick up on because it's not my experience. This movie does dive into different experiences that I have no experience of. So we'll just remember that and tread lightly, I guess. So the movie begins with a passage and it reads, I need forgiveness for my sins but I also need deliverance from the power of sin. I need forgiveness for what I have done, but I also need deliverance from what I am. And the opening credits of this movie really kind of set the tone. Like it's children's drawings and they're very lighthearted. And then you see the sinister start to come out and just something about children's drawings makes it like a hundred times scarier. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's like the abject kind of scary kids trope, but oh, I guess we can also talk about any like correlation to literature it might have. Uh, horror noir directly, uh, the black experience within horror, I think it can have to do with that. I also do think that it kind of relates a little bit to what Barbara Creed is talking about in reference to the woman as possessed monster and how that plays into the narrative of a woman being taken over by a presumably male devil and the implications of that and whatnot. But this doesn't feel like the movie was really trying to touch too deeply on that. So we'll just recognize it and then move on. But yeah, the opening credits, it goes from like a really light kind of feeling to really dark and sinister. And you can just get a sense of this like tainted childhood. And it also pretty much tells you the story that you need to know. So Ebony Jackson, is a mother of three, eldest teen son Nate, preteen daughter Shantae, and young son Dre. And the four have just moved into a new home, their third in a short time frame. So, I mean, right off the bat, we are kind of given this family's plight and their story of financial hardship, but also the mother's own substance issues pertaining to alcohol. And they are joined by Ebony's elder mother, Alberta. Alberta also has cancer. The kind of like opening scene, the dinner scene that we get with the family, that right away is what tells us all of the family's issues. It also sets up the dynamic of the family for us that the kids, kind of obviously are afraid of their mom to some degree. And the relationship between mother and daughter, not just with Ebony and her daughter, but between Ebony and Alberta as well. And at the dinner scene, Ebony does strike Dre and causes his mouth to bleed. Very kind of mommy dearest vibes, like she gets annoyed with him that his body is bleeding because of her violence towards him. You can see that Alberta really cares for the kids and doesn't want to see them, you know? abused. But Dre, that very night after getting hit by his mom, starts to show signs that something isn't right. And this movie, it treads the line of parental abuse or actual like demonic possession. And that's why I think I more so liked this movie because it does kind of keep you on your feet a bit. Like you can understand how it looks to the professional workers that are in this movie and you know, people that are there to protect the kids. I like that dynamic of, is it possession? Is it abuse? A lot of the time, like possession is a story of abuse, an allegory to abuse. I mean, it's a, even in the metaphorical sense, it's a spirit violently taking over another person's body and their autonomy. I think it plays into it, the violence of possession mixed with the violence of parental abuse, because you will notice that Ebony is taking away her children's autonomy when she becomes abusive. They have to look to her for any sign of if it's all right to speak, if it's all right to 
answered the social worker. It, they're constantly looking at their mother for approval, but Dre is like chugging milk, even though we found out he's lactose intolerant and a bird crashes into the window and Dre goes outside and watches it die. So unbeknownst to Alberta, her insurance stopped covering treatment and to prevent a change to a lesser care facility, Ebony has been paying for treatment out of pocket. So that's where the financial issue comes from and a major strain on the family. The concept of poverty is also discussed, I think more so in the documentary done. Like the house in this movie is really freaking nice, okay? Um, if you see the real house, you know it's not the same. <laughs> this did take place in Gary, Indiana, which has one of the highest poverty rates in the entire country, but also one of the highest violence rates in the entire country. Consistent trauma is going to play into these, either you want to think of them as fantasies or actual paranormal activities, <laughs> I guess. That kind of stuff is going to play into it. And multiple times throughout the movie, we also see that Ebony has a hard time taking accountability for how she is choosing to raise her children. Alberta is really the one that kind of fights her on it the most. And we find out that Alberta wasn't the perfect mother either. But Ebony pushing that blame onto Alberta and always being like, Oh, so you were so much better. And Alberta even does specify later in the movie of like, who are you going to blame when I'm no longer here? And maybe it took, spoiler alert, Alberta passes in this. Maybe it took, you know, no longer having that excuse to finally be able to come to Jesus, so to speak. I mean, that's literally kind of what happens. <laughs> but we also get a really interesting scene where it's, Shantae, who's having her hair braided by Ebony, who's having her hair braided by Alberta. And one, it reassures you that like this is a functioning family. They just have issues like every family does. But I did find it interesting because specifically hair braiding is a generational knowledge that is passed down through a family. And it's passed down in ways of like this, you know, sitting there, at the TV at night, just braiding each other's hair. But it like carries story, it carries history. And I find it interesting that Ebony would have most likely had to have learned this from Alberta. And Alberta is criticized a lot of the time of being like a superficial kind of person within the community that she lives in. But I think this scene really shows like the deep care that she has more specifically for her children and the community that they belong to. I found it to be a more wholesome moment and I was more so glad to see Glenn Close not as like this joke character. There is like just seeing Glenn Close dressed the way that she is with the hairstyle and everything like it's funny. The long nails, it's funny to see Glenn Close <laughs> dressed up like that. But it feels like a full-fledged character, not just a caricature of a certain type of woman. You know what I mean? And it also shows that it was, once again, knowledge learned by choice on Alberta's part to pass down to her kids and her grandkids. And that, that doesn't seem like a superficial thing, you know? And I also, I did write down that I thought Alberta is a really interesting character of a very, very specific person. But I think people perceiving her character as a caricature could kind of play into the credence of, I think, Glenn Close's role as the only white actor. I think her role is kind of to be like the token black of a horror movie. It's just the roles have been completely reversed. And I think it's interesting how the public discourse on the character is playing out because it's seemingly not too uncommon 
to hear a lot of the things being said about Glenn Close also being said about actors of color within predominantly white horror movies. And that's what horror noir gets into, so please don't think I'm just pulling this out of nowhere. In horror, specifically, the Black experience is very different from the white experience. And those characters are also perceived very, very differently. And I think that's kind of like where we're treading with the character of Alberta. I don't think she's just there merely for comedic value. I think she is there. There goes the freaking light again. What the hell? I think she's there to progress a different narrative for the film other than just making it a possession movie, you know? Should we just continue without the light because I want to get this video done. It's freaking me the F out. There's also a lot of unspoken familial trauma and the more that like their relationships with each other unfold, the more this activity occurs. I think this could be like an allegory to the abuse and the effects, the trauma that it's actually having, not just on the kids, but on the entire family. Also, just like speaking, if you believe in that type of stuff, those energies are going to feed off of those negative emotions. There is also one night where Ebony gets very drunk. I believe it's for Shantae's birthday party. It's just unfortunate to see. This is also where we see Asia's character come in and she's just hilarious. The very few lines that she has, it's so good. But Dre is having more issues and winding up in weird places of the house. I mean, he was like bashing his head against the inside of the basement cellar door. And Asia's even like, Ebony, the hell's wrong with your kids? <laughs> I'm telling you, like, I don't think Glenn Close is necessarily supposed to be the entire comedic relief of the movie. I think it's Asia's character, but she only comes in for a short little bit. As the movie goes on, the paranormal activity is being perceived by the state workers as Ebony's abuse. It does, it treads the line pretty much right up until the point of possession where we really see, oh, okay, now something is actually up. And I find it interesting because that correlates to the real story a bit where things didn't become real for everyone involved until the hospital. And that's where things get real in this movie. As the film continues, we see that all of the children are now being affected by the constant abuse, whether it's the paranormal or their mother, they're being affected by it and they're starting to act out in ways that are abnormal for them. And that seems like a trauma response, you know, you would maybe act out of character as kind of like a cry for help in a hard situation. Almost at every turn, the movie treads that line of, is it paranormal? Is it the abuse? While at the same time, like weird stuff is happening, but this isn't your typical haunted house movie. It follows the setup of it, but it isn't. There's also a lot of conflict between Ebony's identity and Alberta's identity. And I think more so it's their roles within their lives and within their communities are interpreted very differently by each other. Uh, Ebony has a certain perception that she thinks her mom has of her and of Black people. And Alberta thinks that Ebony has a certain perception of her because she's kind of a stereotype, but I think Alberta proves herself a bit different, you know? I think it's really just Ebony's turmoil with what she's going through that is, you know, feeding these negative emotions that she has about her mother. And that infamous, I know, I know y'all are gonna want me to talk about that scene. It's more towards the end. I think that is the demon specifically playing into Ebony's fears of her mother. And we'll get into that. I don't want to jump too ahead, but I know people are going to be talking about that scene. That one scene. <laughs> it was all over Twitter. And the scene where Alberta finally kind of mentions the blame 
that Ebony is putting onto her to avoid taking accountability for her own parenting. It's also when Ebony addresses how religion for Alberta is a fix. That might be the case. It might be. I think Alberta is kind of validated in her beliefs, you know, as shit gets crazy. Also, the role of the this like psychic medium that comes in. Now, that is more so kind of correlated to the real story, except it was two. I do find it somewhat interesting. I was, I found myself asking, is it still the trope of, and this is just what it's called, please don't get upset at me. This is just what it's known as within like literature is the trope of the magical black person. Or that character can also be portrayed by someone with a mental disability a lot of the times like what what movie is it is it dream catcher where like the person who saves the day ultimately is a n almost non-verbal autistic person so it's a trope within horror i just found myself like kind of asking like is it still the fulfillment of that trope, even if it's in a Lee Daniels movie. I think it's more so just like how they wanted to carry the story along. And that's just how it kind of turned out. But I think it's worth acknowledging, like her character fulfills that role that we know. And Alberta is also attacked and killed by the spirit, which takes the form of, it kind of has like the outline of a Dementor at first, you know what I mean? But it's smoke. It's just black smoke. And then it also takes the form of Dre at one point. But I found it very, sorry, I'm looking around. I'm so sketched out. But I found it very interesting that this is really kind of the only physical representation of the spirit that we get other than when it takes the form of the people around Ebony. It's very similar to the apparition that is seen in the Demon House documentary. And there is a very clear apparition that they catch in the bathroom during that. So we'll talk about that in the next video. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> Once again, as the story progresses, it seems that Dre has these experiences and the really like hardcore paranormal activity always comes after experiencing some form of his mother's abuse and even emotional abuse as well, because she's not a very loving mom all the time, you know? And I can see the nuance to her character and to her character as a mother. She cares about those kids a lot. I'm not saying that she doesn't. It's just the way that it's shown sometimes is interesting. <laughs> we'll say that. This is also the part where eventually the kids wind up in a hospital as well as Ebony because She's driving them away from the house. She sees Dre in the back seat. His eyes are completely black and he's just like speaking, uh, but not in his voice. And so she pulls over, runs into a bar asking for help and she gets brought to a hospital because like clearly she's losing it a bit. And the mental health evaluation that she has, like the questions directly parallel the type of experiences that she's been having and she's just trying her best to not come off as crazy, even though all of her answers are pointing to like she might be. And we also find out that Ebony did have a very traumatic experience when she was a little girl that she was assaulted by a male. She really can only overcome this like greater evil once she overcomes this prior trauma. And it's that prior trauma that I think is also fueling her abuse and her addiction as well. Maybe more so the addiction part. The abuse seems to come from Alberta because they do make reference to the fact that Alberta was a physical parent as well. And this is where we get the scene of Dre walking backwards up the wall. Now it didn't happen quite like they portrayed it, but there is firsthand account from a doctor and from the state child protective services worker. And she quit 
and needed years of therapy after this. Dre was holding on to his mother's or the nurse's hands and then very slowly, well, no, he slid across the floor. She held his hands and he walked backwards up the wall. And basically everyone ran out of the room when that happened. That's the real actual account that multiple people were eyewitness to. So Ebony, kind of realizing what has to be done, she, is it kidnapping? She kidnaps Dre from the hospital and brings him back to the house to perform a exorcism, essentially, on her son with the medium that she met up with earlier. The medium does say that the demon will take the form of those that you love. And the first form after its little like interaction with Dre, the first form it takes is this really possessed and nasty looking Glenn Close. Now this is a great scene, honestly, I think. Put what's said aside, Glenn Close's acting is so freaking good and so is Andre Day's. It's just, this was a really good cast, you guys. It was a really, really good cast. But the demon's portrayal of Alberta fed into this very negative perception Ebony had of her own mother. This covertly racist woman, which I don't think that was the case. I don't think that's who Alberta's character was or was really meant to be, but it's the demon feeding into that fear that Ebony has of her own mother. I also think there's a moment with CGI on the kid's face. Now, there are moments where you can see his face. It's kind of like an exorcist-like thing, you know, where they overlay Pazuzu's face on Reagan's. It's kind of like that, where you can see that it's not him. Like, it's not him, but it is, you know? That part, I don't necessarily mind. It's more so the scenes where I think they were trying to cover up the fact that they didn't want a little boy to say what's said in this film. It's very harsh language. So they just CGI imposed his face and made it look like spooky, you know? That's what it comes off as. It, does, it almost doesn't come off like it's actually the kid saying it, but... His acting is freaking incredible. For a child actor, incredible, incredible acting. I also, there is some like hints of comedy within this movie. Like Glenn Close's character absolutely is a comedic force within it. I don't think for necessarily the reason that people are attributing it to her for, but there's one scene where the medium gets dragged by the hair and it had to be a joke because they put the like, like stretching noise in there as like a shrinkage joke. Like the demon started pulling and it wasn't until a few seconds after it started that she actually started to go, you know, like her hair really stretched out. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. I don't know why. I was just like, that was such an interesting point to put in, I guess. And yeah, I did write down that I love the kind of Pazuzu style overlay on the child's face. I thought that definitely added to the creepiness of it because creepy children for the longest time has been a trope within horror, but more specifically a trope within abject horror because there's just something about demonic little kids that just really freaking creeps you out, right? <laughs> Eventually, the fight does move down into the basement where it seems the majority of occurrences come from. And the demon does take the form of ebony. Now, this also plays into abject horror traditionally because the idea of the other and the other being a replica of yourself, this like evil doppelganger, that's abjection. So we're touching a lot of the bases in this, all right? That's why I do think this is a deeper film than just some for the money blockbuster horror just told through a different perspective. You know what I mean? Also just representing that Ebony's biggest demon is herself. The body horror in this movie is also really well done. Now, I don't know if it's real, 
but the scene where it's literally just Ebony throwing herself into the ground, it's so scary. And then she, you know, flips back, does that kind of signature possession pose. But that scene with her smashing her head into the concrete floor of the basement, it's so like, oh, kind of like brings you into the severity of it because it does have a fantastical kind of feeling. She also kind of begins to reminisce a bit on like the fonder memories. She kind of has like a coming to God moment. This is where the movie gets a little bit corny, but I'm not gonna lie. I kind of felt it like, <laughs> if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. She hears Alberta's voice saying, I know you don't want to talk to me, but you can talk to God. And I loved this scene. I don't know why y'all know I'm not, I'm not. A religious person like that but it felt like something you know like and then she gets pulled right back in and that's when she begins to pray i guess but then she's overcome by the power of the lord whatever you want to call it and she begins to speak in tongues i have n almost never seen this represented in a possession movie like this before. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the whole speaking in tongues aspect, it's usually looked at in a mocking way. And this, it's not at all. It's actually like validating it. And now, while well, I don't really believe in all that stuff, but I thought it was a very like kind of reviving moment. Like, oh, there's hope again. Also see that while this exorcism is going on with Dre and Ebony, Shantae and Nate, they're both separated in different homes, essentially. They're also having experiences. Nate is, he in the end is in the pose of Jesus Christ. So he experiences the stigmata appearing on him as well. Holes in the hands. And he also is self-cannibalizing while the exorcism is happening. That feels like a perversion of a holy thing, you know? It, I mean, Christians, y'all do kind of participate in ritualistic cannibalism, which I'm not shaming you for that, <laughs> all right? But that ritualistic cannibalism being portrayed through Nate, I think it really does something. And then Shantae as well also experiences stigmata. She hovers into the air. She's bleeding from her temples, like where Jesus bled from with the crown of thorns. And she also as well, I think it's in her wrists, has holes in her wrists, much like some portrayals of Jesus. It's different for different people if it was through the wrist or through the hand. So the children are experiencing this as well. As we see, I guess the exorcism was a success that like soft music washes over, mother holds her child. And we find out six months have gone by and Ebony has gotten her kids back. The movie also mentions the house's bulldozing in 2016, but also mentions the continuation of those experiences. Alrighty guys, so for this one, we're not gonna do the reviews. You can't find like reviews on Netflix and it's not available to stream anywhere else or even to buy anywhere else. So we're not going to do the reviews, but let me know your thoughts, guys. I definitely want to know what you thought about the movie because I think there's a lot of division amongst it. I enjoyed it. I think it's a lot more superficial of a movie than people probably would expect from Lee Daniels, but I think there's more there to sink your teeth into if you really want to. I thought it was good. This is like his first time really doing a horror movie, isn't it? I thought it was good. I'd watch another one, but yeah. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Let me know your thoughts on the characters as well, because I do think they are very interesting characters. And yeah, keep an eye out for the Hollywood versus reality or whatever <laughs> video that'll be out shortly. And yeah, thank you so much, you guys. Once again, like and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts and I will catch you in the next one. Take care.